We are live. Good evening from Israel. Good morning from California. We are streaming live today and tonight. Uh, this is TMS Roundtable. I am Dr. Tova Goldfein, and before I introduce my guest, I always forget to tell people what I'm doing here. <laughs> so this is, I, I believe, number 161 or number 62 broadcast. Um, we have been going live for three years, almost every week, with outstanding guests and professors and scientists and doctors and health professionals and people that have self-healed from everything from cancer to arthritis to MS to chronic pain, all using these mind and body, art and science, I call it, state-of-the-art methods of understanding the deep connection between the mind and the body, which to me is very scientific. This is not a new age alternative health show. This is about healing and this is about inspiration and education. And again, my name is Dr. Tova Goldfein and I am so thrilled to have a guest tonight that I kind of just met. So I just want to tell you how I met him because it's so exciting to me, Dr. Paul Hansma. Hansma, did I say it correctly? Yep, that's right. Okay, I'm going to bring this up. Um, Dr. Paul, I met through a patient <laughs> who showed me these YouTubes all about central sensitization and healing pain. And I was like, I want to see it. And even my, I didn't think you were available. And my client said, call him. And I email you and you answer. <laughs> And I thought, okay, you know, we're a small community of doctors and therapists in this world, and we 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 like educating, and we're available. And if we can come on the show, like I had, just it's I'm so thrilled and honored. So real quick, this patient of mine had chronic RSI, repetitive strain injury, and um, could not use the computer for ten more than 10 minutes without excruciating pain. He sees your videos. He gets like 50% better. He does some PRT, some pain reprocessing therapy with me. He, he fires me because he gets better in four weeks. And he's just doing amazing because he just gets it. And I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Paul Hansma who just gets it because it, it is hard to understand that we have to think psychological about pain. I know it's it's like a dis, disconnect and it's like counterintuitive, but we're going to talk about that tonight. And so Dr. Paul Hansma is a professor of physics and a researcher. Oh, wait, I want to say this because I love that you're, Dr. Paul, I love that you're involved with, um, you're on the faculty in, in the Center for Aging and Longevity Studios because you can see Dr. Paul and I go to the same hairdresser. You have a chronic pain science channel on YouTube. You're a researcher in neuroscience in the Research Institute in UCSB, something in California. And you are a professor of physics. So you have a very strong left brain. And I love that your wife is an artist to help you balance out your right and left brain. So enough about me. Welcome to Thank our you. show. Talk a little bit, please, about how it began for you. And I know we met and spoke, but you were in the guard, which I know you don't like very much because you said it in one of your YouTubes. And you were having a fight with a, what kind of tree? Yeah, it was a big bougainvillea <laughs> tree in my backyard. And uh, and it uh, was beautiful, but it had gotten wholly overgrown. It was about six feet thick and just dense with dead. And one day I decided it was the day to... Uh, Prune the whole thing really back and uh, so I started at it and um, worked all morning my shoulder got kind of sore I decided I needed help I hired a couple of guys to help me and uh, unfortunately I kept working with them you know all afternoon long we filled up a truck with with all of the vines from this thing and my shoulder started hurting and uh, mm, five years later it was still hurting despite wow. A lot of physical therapy and some shots and this and that 
Um, and everything gave you like temporary relief, but nothing really took it took away the pain. Yeah, and it would seem like it was getting better, and then I would reach up to undo a gate or something like that, and then it would seem like it, you know, got much much worse again. I had all these setbacks, and and uh, so finally, someone said to me, you know, just put your arm in a sling for three weeks. And so I thought, well, I'll do, I'll try that. And uh, so I was used to doing 15 minutes of physical therapy every day. And so I thought, well, how am I going to use that 15 minutes to help recover from chronic pain? So I started looking on the internet and I found the videos by John Sarno and Howard Schubiner and, and uh, Alan Gordon and uh, Lorimer Mosley. Those were the ones that were most helpful to me. And I, and started reading John Sarno's books and, and uh, it kind of resonated with me that yes, and a month later, um, my pain was mostly gone. What did you do uh, in that month? Did you journal? Did you meditate? Did you just, you just sort of figured it out that the brain was? Yeah, I just kept watching content, basically. I just kept watching content and trying to learn, trying to, you know, apply it to myself. But basically it was, uh, it was learning and uh, learning that I could be sore but safe. And, and to try sore to keep safe. It, sore but safe was a very useful phrase for me. The, and I'll demonstrate with a little machine here how you can be sore but safe. But understanding that I didn't need to get anxious and fearful just because I was sore um, really kind of helped me break the kind of pain fear cycle. And I, I had the funny situation at one point I was uh, sitting in my chair um, looking out the window and um, all of a sudden, my um, my elbow started hurting, uh, and, and and actually that had started when I did the Bougainvillea, and it had moved to my shoulder. But my elbow started hurting, and I, there was a part of my brain I could I said, "This, you know, you've got to be kidding me. Cut it out." And the pain went away right away, which was very startling to me because you know it was real graphic demonstration that the brain can decide whether or not to generate the experience of pain based wow. based on whether the brain thinks it's a good idea and whether it's necessary to protect you or not. And and so, yeah. So, so then, I just want to make to the audience that because Schrubiner says in his, in his book, um, uh, not Unlearned Pain, Unlearned Your Pain, but a book he wrote with Dr. Alan Abbas about, um, um, I'm forgetting right now the name, but he says that sometimes we have to talk to the brain not bully it, but sort of be like, okay, enough. I get it. Like, and you did that. You were like, say what you said to your elbow. You got to be kidding me. Cut it out. Yeah. Like you, you know, so you weren't, you weren't bullying. You were like having a little, having like a convert, like a cup of coffee with it. Like, come on elbow. And he talks about one of his patients who literally journals and write and talks to her brain. And that's what we're talking about here. This is part of like, it is a relationship with the brain. So, Go ahead. So the elbow, and then it was the same elbow with the same shoulder. Yeah, and then, and so then anyway, after my shoulder got better, you know, I decided this was exciting, and I wanted to talk to other people about it. And I talked to one person that I'm part of a college discussion group, old friends that we went to college together and been meeting, and uh, she had some chronic pain and shooting down her leg, and I talked to her about this stuff, and she got better. And so then I decided, well, I would like to give a talk about this. And so anyway, I got invited to give a talk at the Goleta Library. And that talk is on YouTube, Chronic Pain Science Channel. Yeah, I've been advertising. There's six or seven, six to seven separate YouTubes of you go through very methodically. And you're going to show us the machine soon, but fabulous information. You know, you talk about biofeedback. You talk about Qi Kong and the research, which is so profound because there is an enormous amount of research in the power of qi kong what is qi kong doing what do you think qi kong is doing with the qi what's happening with the brain and the body in qi kong uh, you know there may be you know um a subtle you know esoteric effects involving you know the qi but the i think the really easy to understand effect of it is that you you let your body experience safe sensations. You let your brain experience safe sensations. And, and so you do some motion that may cause momentary sensations, but then you're doing another motion which causes other sensations. And basically your brain ends up feeling, because Qigong 
a pull qigong exercise or tai chi can involve pretty much all your muscle groups you know your brain gets signals from all of those groups and understands that these are safe signals and so it kind of trains your brain that signals that are coming like that can be safe that they're not dangerous and so it's the problem when people you know becoming active and go to bed is then you know the brain doesn't get used to signals and so all of a sudden they get out of bed and their back hurts and it's like freaking them out because whoa uh, whereas if their brain has gotten used to getting signals like this and doesn't freak out and says yeah these are just sensations you know this is nothing to freak out about i do not need that from the standpoint of the unconscious brain i do not need to cause the experience of pain to protect my creature these are just you know so i think that's the real benefit of um exercises in general and qigong and tai chi in particular in particular because they're very very gentle and yes. so you can do them without fear of injuring yourself yes. yes amazing so i just want to review for the listeners um the youtubes i've been advertising all over facebook that six or seven six, i put six up um and you you go through the machine which we're going to look at and you talk about um you know education biofeedback um qigong and and then you mention um what's the fourth thing yeah well another thing that can be useful is visualization yes and, and um somatic tracking and the sense of, uh, somatic tracking visualization can be useful of course physical therapy can be useful chiropractic can be useful in terms of learning what is safe to move i mean you know a, a, a um a chiropractor or physical therapist can let you know how you can move safely and even though you might experience some intense sensations while you're doing this motion you can have their assurance that this is safe and so your brain can just accept that this is safe sensation and i don't have to you know freak out about this and and try to protect my creature by by mm -hmm. generating intense pain and of course cognitive therapy can be useful some people have stressors from their childhood or from their current situation that make the world seem like a more dangerous place. And yeah. pain is a broad warning you you're in danger. And if you feel the world is a dangerous place for other, from other stressors, of course, you're going to feel pain more. So why, why do you, so I know we chatted about this before the show, but were you shocked that you had a five year shoulder problem? Like, was it like, what, like, were you, questioning yourself and like why is this happening i mean sure why, so what what were some of the answers you were able to because like obviously you had this yeah you know relationship with yourself before the five years yeah living a life and then you have this chronic shoulder pain from just doing work in some bushes in the garden and yeah. you're thinking like what what like what appeared to you like something like a big light bulb moment probably came to you when you figured this out and then a month later you're out of pain after five years yeah well it was more just a very helpful suggestion from from you know a friend to try to you know put my arm in a sling and kind of change my way of thinking that helped me change my way of thinking from the fact that i had a physical problem to the fact that there might be some you know other problem that wasn't strictly physical and um and the advantage of having the arm in a sling for me was I was very used to working on my problem and, you know, and the chiropractor doing, 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 the physical therapist says just work to the point of pain. Well, I figured, well, let's go a little into it. You know, I mean, let's, I want to get better. Right. I want, and I didn't realize that this is very counterproductive to create pain that scares you. Um, while you're doing your exercises. And I didn't know that at the time I thought, you know, the more I could endure, faster I would recover, but well, no, more, is, more is better, more is better. I, as I understand now, you know, I was making a mistake because I was keeping alive the idea that this was dangerous. And, um, and so for me, it was helpful to put it in a sling because then after three weeks, you know, I knew that I hadn't injured it, you know, I, I had not re injured it. And so if it, if it, uh, yeah. And, and that was very helpful to me mm -hmm. to know that, 
the pain I was experiencing wasn't because of some way in which I had injured myself by right. overdoing the, the physical therapy or trying to machine or trying to do things like that. So for me personally, that was helpful. I, I, I don't know that I would recommend that for other people because I, I didn't know all the kind of information that you and others are teaching. And now with all that kind of information, you can maybe, you know, get the same result of training your brain that, that sensations, um, which it previously used to generate the experience of pain are actually safe. Right. No, it's, it's very, you know, you, say, you speak, you say it very, um, it's easy to understand when you speak, you're speaking the, you know, the terms of, of the brain and pain and, and rehab and, and, but a lot of people who do still come to our show are not getting better like you. They're not getting better by the book. They're not in their recovery um, the way they want to be. They're frustrated. They're, you know, going to different coaches. And I always like to say like, you know, like we want to be these, there are people that do get better in a month and read the book, but what, let, yeah. even Dr. Schubiner says there's 40% of the people who are not getting better. And, you know, Rose and I like to address those people because there is hope, there is belief, which is chemical. There's compassion, which is chemical. There's patience, which is a chemical reaction. You know, hugging is a chemical reaction. So there's, we're chemical energetic beings. So what I want to say is what, before we look at the machine, which is very technical and very logical and makes so much sense, and maybe we'll help people have a little breakthrough, because that's my, my goal is that people come to the show and leave with like that last thing they needed to like cross the bridge, you know? And so what would you say to some people who are in their struggle and in their mind and not really in their body and kind of like having sensations, not at the gym, but only at the office or only when they're in a relationship with their husband. Like it's not, it's, it's typically, it's more psychological. Like what would you say, even though you healed in a month by reading the book and looking at YouTube, what would you suggest? Well, I mean, I see a lot of people who come to my office next week. I'm going to be, seeing 10 people who are going to be coming to the next study that I'm running. Right, and, I saw that. Yeah. and what I find to be most useful, frankly, is starting with the model, um, I, because I think that really helps put things in context. And so I, I would propose to do that now to show the model. Good. So I'm going to switch to the other webcam Terrific. that will show the Some model that's questions. behind me more clearly. Great. Terrific. Okay. Um, okay. So, can you still hear me? Yeah, just put it in the middle of the screen. You see, like, so I'm gonna be perfect. That's perfect. Excellent. All right. So, basically, um, this model kind of explains how pain works. And so, if you take your own hand, take your own hand right now if you're watching and kind of lift your finger a little bit and you notice at first you just feel sensation. There's no pain there. It's just a little bit of sensation. I Leave feel I feel sensation in my joint. Yeah. And you reach it a little further and it starts to, a little bit of pain. You know, your body is telling you, your mind is telling you, wait a minute, this is going to be a little bit dangerous. And you go a little bit further, it's kind of like, this is dangerous. Stop doing that. And so you let it go and the pain goes away and the sensation goes away and you do it again you go to a little bit of pain you let it go so let's look at this from the context of this model so i can raise the finger here and what this shows is the um signal from the finger so at first there's just a little bit of signal from the finger you're not up to the level of pain or anything this is just a signal from the finger if you go a little bit higher now you start to see some pain over on this side. This is pain. You care if we're up to pain four and you let it go and the pain goes away. And you, you, you bend the finger a little bit more and it gets a little more dangerous. You get into more pain and you let the finger go and it goes away. Now, this is the way pain should work, right? This is pain really helping you. It's telling you that there's danger. And it's so elegant because as 
you know, this pain sensation is generated inside the brain. Um, the, the signal goes up into the brain, the brain generates the experience of pain, and in this incredibly elegant system you, involving the somatosensory cortex, it makes you feel the pain in your finger. You, you perceive the pain that's in your finger. And so it not only tells you you're in danger, but it tells you exactly where the danger is. The danger is in your finger. It's an incredibly elegant system that goes horribly wrong in chronic pain, in a way we'll see. Because what happens is, let's say you go further and you actually injure your finger. Like the way up here, ah, injured it. Now, the signal comes down more slowly because the finger has to heal over the period of hours, days, months. Finally, the finger heals. But in some cases, like in my case, in the case of people with chronic pain, the pain doesn't go away. Why didn't the pain go away when the finger healed? The answer is because of sensitization. Pain is generated by the brain. The brain can become sensitized to these signals to where it can generate the experience of pain even when you have safe signals. So here's an example of being sore but safe. You're actually safe but your finger feels very sore and if you move it a little bit it feels really sore. Now at this point there's nothing you can do. You're tempted to try to fix the finger because that's where it hurts, you know, and so you're tempted to try to fix it or, you know, be nice to it or that kind of thing. But, of course, that's not really going to help you because the signal's already basically healed. The finger is already healed. The problem is... And that's why the steroid shot doesn't work, because the steroid is getting rid of inflammation, but the inflammation is not in the finger. It's in the brain. It's yes, being created the, by... That's right. And in the case of my shoulder, I had what was diagnosed as bursitis, which is pain plus inflammation. The point is, if your brain is generating the experience of pain, it will put in some fluid to pad the joints. So you'll end up getting inflammation in addition, not because the shoulder is hurt, but because the shoulder is in pain because the brain is sent, has sensitization. So at this point, there's nothing you can do to the finger. You have to reduce sensitization. So how do you reduce sensitization? Fortunately, there's well- How do we make ourselves, how do we make our brain less sensitive? Exactly. And there's different ways to do it. For example, one way is education, just like looking at this model, realizing that you can be sore, but safe. Just because you're sore doesn't mean you're safe. And the kind of things that you maybe learned on previous episodes here, or you can read about in the books of John Sarno or Howard Schubiner, and basically you learn these things, and it'll gradually turn down that sensitization a little bit. Another way is therapy. Physical therapy or chiropractic can help you learn how to move safely, can help you learn that you are safe doing a particular motion, even though you may have experienced some discomfort, it's actually safe and gradually your brain can learn that these sensations that you're experiencing are safe. Cognitive therapy can help resolve emotional issues which contribute to pain. Pain is a signal you're in danger. Right. Now, if you feel you're in danger for other reasons, like global warming or um, race relations or, um, or your car has just been in a wreck or you, you know, your relative is sick, if you're under stress and you have stressors in your life or childhood abuse, a lot of stressors can increase your sense of danger and the brain gives you a signal of pain that, that feels you're in danger to warn you about danger. And so, Cognitive therapy can help you um, resolve some of these stressors. Um, movement is very helpful. Being able to move, if once you learn how you can move safely, just moving to let your body experience sensations without freaking out. Um, biofeedback can be very helpful. Biofeedback can teach you how to lower your fight or flight response. People with chronic pain often get into fight or flight. Um, and fight or flight gives you an added sense of danger, right? Fight or flight is, there's danger, you better fight or flee. And, but people become habitually in the state of fight or flight, unfortunately, and it's not good for them physiologically for reasons we'll explain in a minute, but biofeedback can help you learn how to get out of fight or flight, can help you learn how to do that. And finally, 
uh, mindfulness practices such as somatic tracking, things like that, visualization, and in combination, they can reduce sensitization much faster. And so you can use a combination of techniques, whatever works for you. Once your sensitization is gone, now pain is back to being your friend. Pain is back to being an accurate representation of the danger that you're in. Okay, so let me stop there and see if like you have any questions or if you're that's well, <clears throat> um, if anyone has any questions in the in his listening, we're happy to answer. Um, please feel free to reach out on the Facebook page. What I what I'm fascinated, you know, is first of all, you know, we a lot of us learn from a picture, so it's very smart. Like we we were able to uh, imagine, and now we have this picture in our mind about the lighting and the finger. So it's brilliant it's brilliant that you did that and um is it does the sense sense the central sensitization would, would that be the same thing as like predictive coding like dr schubiner talks about that word where you know i expect my back to hurt because it always hurt so i expect to be anxious because i was anxious growing up like it's kind of this pathway so has, has the brain created a pathway here that like the phantom leg, and then we have to create a new pathway. Is that what you're saying, more or less? As uh, well? Absolutely. Basically, you know, I mentioned the other part of my research was neuroscience. And um, yes. for instance, uh, I'm looking for this thing. I don't see it right off. But basically, in this other research, we right now we're making human brain organoids, and we're studying them electrically with a lot of electrodes. And basically, these human brain organoids will, neurons will fire, they'll excite other neurons. You get these pathways of neural activity that are repetitive, repetitive neural activity. This is with no input whatsoever. Point is the brain can have neural circuits that will generate the experience of pain that'll run with no input whatsoever. They just run by themselves. Neurons exciting other neurons, neurons exciting other neurons, neurons exciting other neurons. And, and, and this is related to the to the uh, predictive coding. Basically, the brain feels this is the right thing to do to, to keep this pattern running. The brain feels- Where's it What's it, Where's it getting the message to do that? Because it's getting some kind of message. Originally, it got the message, say, from an injury or from a trauma or from something that made you feel that you were in danger or that the part of your body that started hurting was in danger. So originally, it might have even been a genuine, you know, appropriate response of the brain to generate the experience of pain. Um, but then it gets in the habit of doing that. It's just like riding a bike. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Once it gets in the habit of generating the experience pain, it just continues, right? Because there's not much negative feedback. The brain is not is more interested in keeping you safe than it is in keeping you happy or pain-free or, right. or, or feeling good. The brain wants to protect you. That's its primary right. mission. And, and it, it, it gets into this habit of generating the experience of pain and you you survive and you you know you eat drink you know the, from the brain's point of view it's working it's working i'm generating this experience of pain and my creature is surviving and you know um it, so unfortunately the brain needs to get feedback that this pattern is 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 not what we want you know it's not yes the creature isn't dying, your creature isn't dying, but you're not doing them any favor by making them miserable, right? right. And so, yeah, eventually. No, it's, 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 it's a good point. Now you're getting closer to, um, we had another scientist on, we had her a few times, a wonderful scientist, uh, Dr. Bethany Rains, who talks about um, pain as an emotion. And I, I, don't, I didn't learn that till a few years ago that pain is processed in the same place as fear and anger and shame and guilt some of these core emotions that um can can drive the um with the brain senses the brain senses these kind of emotions uh or they studied that they're processed like somebody can feel anger or fear um i think they did it on some kind of research on people when people were socially rejected there was a research project so if i'm feeling fear or anger 
shame or guilt or love. I even think sexual excitement was one of these feelings. In the amygdala, something would light up in this research project and they same thing with pain. It was the same center. And what they discovered that, is that this brain is not distinguishing between a psychological and a physical threat. It's experiencing uh, a threat. So when you say, so the pain is, so this is the amygdala that's creating this central, because some people like to know where it's happening and I think that helps them. So can you talk well, a little bit about that? And that, how that, that was by Tor Wagger, in my opinion, that there, there was work done earlier, um, uh, what's his name, starts with an A, but anyway, there's been quite a bit of brain imaging with fMRI of the centers that are involved in active, in generating experience, Ashkenazi or something also, about the brain centers that are involved with the experience of pain. Um, and, and it's multiple brain centers. It's not just one. It's a lot of brain centers. They noticed in the in the in this landmark um, study in Colorado, where 66% of people had suffered from lower back pain for 10 years or more were pain-free or nearly pain-free after um, pain reprocessing therapy. They noticed that there was less activation in the part of the brain that was involved with threats and rewards and. Um, but it's a complex situation in the brain in terms of where where these signals are located. Tor Wagger has he, he identified a, um, uh, a, a basically a nociceptive independent pain cir circuit in the brain, where he identified a circuit that could run in the absence of, of signals from the body, like we're talking about here with right. sensitization. So there have been fMRI studies on that, and it's um, it's it's um, it's complex, but but the basic message is that the brain is generating the experience of pain inappropriately, right? Out of habit, right? And and can you chat a little bit about um, Dr. Paul? Can you chat a little bit about? Um, and I'm just losing my signal for a minute. Okay, can you chat about? So the good news. <clears throat> is that um, the brain can learn pain and the brain can unlearn pain. And Yoni Asher says that in the movie, Pain Brain, which just came out, an amazing movie about the research project and showing some amazing healing <clears throat> and that no one's immune. Everyone can heal from this way. <clears throat> and people with years and years. <clears throat> in fact, Dr. Schubner talked about, doesn't matter how many years you've had the pain, the brain can learn it. Sometimes it will take longer depending on the trauma that you had because of the predictive coding, but we're meeting people that are healing. And so can you chat a little bit about, it's like, I say, oh, well, the brain can change. So, okay, so it's a habit. I just got to practice a new habit. I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth. I don't negotiate with that. I brush my teeth. It's like, I want to have clean teeth. So I want to have no pain. I want to, so I'm going to learn this habit. And there's a struggle because it's more of a, a relationship. It's more of a like compassionate sense of self. It's more of a being patient with yourself. It's a communication. It's a language. And, and people are usually reacting and not responding. And we talk about getting better at feeling before you can feel better. And so we play on those words. And we kind of help people, but it is a habit that yeah. people have to learn when it comes down to the brass nuts. I'm learning a new pathway. The man gets his leg cut off, God forbid, and he learns the pain is in his brain and not in his leg. So is there like a, like a set of time that people can learn? Like, Because some people are like, how long is it going to take, Doc? And I'm like, it can possibly just take a month. Like, 40 days in the desert. Like, what do you think if somebody's doing these five or six things, can they change their pathway and change the habit? Yeah. Well, our chronic pain recovery studies, have just completed three of them. And basically they're a month long. And uh, the most recent ones have had people reading Alan Gordon's book, The Way Out. Um, this is a really excellent book, I think, for people. Um, because it's very well written. It's very, 
very entertaining. People like it. Um, um, He's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. But the Way Out by Alan Gordon. I'll show it on the screen. I've got a yeah. copy by the computer over there. But there's one thing I want to show on the model before I go back there. But anyway, so for me, our group, they read the book. We have um, five weekly Zoom sessions. And they're asked to spend basically an hour a day on this. And after a month, um, almost everyone is improved. And most so wait a minute. So you're doing this study that is this, you're still looking for people because I can put it out on my on my Facebook page. Well, the current study is full, but we are have a wait list for our fall study. Um, okay, is, they have to be in person. They have to be in person in California. Um, yeah, you no, need to see them in person. We, they, we can do it via Zoom. But but one of the things that's that's in our study, and this is, you know, I like to build gadgets. I'm, I'm a physicist. And the other gadget that we built, which is very helpful and that we use in these studies, and in fact, is the reason for these studies is the biofeedback. I mentioned biofeedback can help people learn to calm themselves. And this is our biofeedback device, our current one. Okay. Basically, it's... Uh, it's called the calm stone and you hold it in your palm and the lights change according to the color uh, uh, to the temperature of your See, hand yeah. i have like two blues now for instance and basically if i can calm myself what will happen is with fight or flight the blood flies away from your hands in order to go to the muscles so you can fight or flee but if you can calm yourself the blood will come back to the hands. And so this will show you how effective you are at calming yourself. And so people figure out what's best for them to calm themselves. For some people, it's paced breathing. This has a, for some one person, it was petting her cat. Um, another person tried waking, watching Breaking Bad. That didn't work out very well. Uh, <laughs> you know, for some people, it's visualization of a beach. But you notice now, like one more light has changed to blue, and basically, as you warm your hands, um, the lights change color. And eventually, originally, if your hands are cold, you know the lights are warm like this. But then, you know, as your hand comes up to it, it, and it sees my hand. It's an infrared thermometer, so it's instant responding. But when it sees my hand instead of what's behind it, the lights start changing color like mm -hmm. this. So that's the process that continues as you learn to calm yourself and so this can be done with any kind of thermometer but this particular one is kind of user friendly and uh -huh. and people did you create that that yeah. little thing so wait dr paul you're supposed to be retired well i um i end up working about uh from 10 to 6 monday through thursday other than that i'm retired <laughs> Okay, let's we'll see what your wife says about that. Um, but no, we built. Uh, yeah, I'm going to change back to the other camera now. Okay. Um, it's amazing. I know you're. I know you're. So this this machine is the one on the YouTube, the big machine with the hand. People can see that on the YouTube how that works. Um, the, there's an older version of that chronic pain demo that's on the YouTube. Um, on my YouTube, there's an older version of that one, um, but you know it tells the same basic message. Um, but yeah, so over if the you were to if you were to hold that in your hand and scream, yeah, like how, like it would it would it would how, red means it's it's not you're not relaxed, right? So how can um, you get it? To, so what do you have to do to make it go red? You have to be stressed stressed out, or you do something, or you think something, or yeah, I'd have to be kind of stressed out like I, it, 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 these lights kind of burn out the camera but yeah i'd have to um, i've never tried to make it go the other way <laughs> and in fact by now it's it's kind of a conditioned response for me i pick this thing up and i start being coming more calm just because it's right. a conditioned response I, I don't know. I, I don't think I want to make myself anxious and try No, to well, you know, it, part of it is is again so many of us with chronic pain are calm and cool on the outside, but inside there's rage and there's fear and there's anger and there's, you know, you wouldn't know it. And that's why 
it's this pathway from the head to the heart or this connection from the conscious to the unconscious. Now you mentioned the unconscious mind, which I'd like to hear your left brain talk about the unconscious mind a little bit. Well, the decision to make the experience of pain is of course not a conscious decision. Um, the decision to make the experience of pain is an unconscious decision, just like the, just like um, a lot of things. I mean, your body, right, controls so many systems. It controls your blood glucose. It controls your 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 cortisol. It controls so many so many things. Your your mind is controlling. I mean, there's 10 million signals per second coming into your brain from sensors all over your body, including your eyes and ears and the touch and temperature. There's all this information coming into your brain, right? And your brain has the job of deciding if any of this information is dangerous, if there's anything we need to pay attention to. For instance, if you think about it, pay attention to the bottom of your foot and you can feel the pressure of the floor pressing up on your foot. You can feel that, right? Now that you pay attention to it. But before I mentioned it, you were totally unaware of that because the same signals are coming to your brain, but your brain was saying, okay, this is not a problem. This is, this, we're exactly. used to this. this is not a problem. And, and this is what the brain does. It gets all these signals in and unconscious, there's unconscious mechanisms for screening them. You're not conscious of all 10 million of them going down a list. Is this safe? Is this safe? Is this safe? It's totally unconscious processing. And it's an amazing amount of processing. I mean, it's 10 million signals to decide if they're safe or not. Um, but the brain does in general, an amazing job of it until things go wrong. And, uh, it's true. and, and so it, um, and so the brain makes the unconscious decision to create the experience of pain. If what it predicts should be the signals coming from your foot are not the signals coming from your foot. So if all of a sudden there's this intense, large signal from your foot coming, the brain says, wait a minute, that's not the way it should be, you know, and it'll call your attention to it, um, by generating the experience of pain. And unfortunately, it's Very interesting. I have, I have a few more questions for you, but Patty is asking a question. So here's her question. Looking at your example of the finger, does it mean you should pay attention to the pain and adjust? Oh, that's a good question, Patty. That, that is such an important question because um, I would say, you know, professional help is needed. You, you, you need to know whether it's safe to move what over what range is it safe to move your finger or you know say you have a shoulder thing you know you go to a physical therapist or something you find out over what range is it safe to move my shoulder if you're moving your shoulder or your finger in a way that you know to be safe then you don't want to pay attention to it right you just want to say okay sorb it's safe sorb it's safe i don't care let me get fry some eggs or do something like that i mean it's like you know, I get up in the morning, right? And I'm 77 years old. I get up in the morning. I'm a little stiff. Now, I could freak out and say, oh, my back, my back. Oh, my God, it's hurting again. You know, and I was supposed to be on uh, Rose and Toba today. And if my back gets any worse, you know, I'm not going to be able to do it. You know, oh, my God, it is getting worse. You know, and you kind of freak out. You can really create a whole, whole symphony of pain and fear like that. The other way to do it is you get up and you say, well, yeah, there's sensation, sure. Every morning I get up, there's sensation, right? I mean, this is, I'm safe. I know that if I just start my day and I make my coffee and and go to the bathroom and start my breakfast, I mean, if I just go about my activities in a half hour, I'm not going to notice it. Or 10 minutes, I'm not going to notice it. It's just, um, it's sort of it's safe. And so as long as you can convince yourself you're safe, either by experience or because of something a professional tells you, then yeah, sorb it's safe, sorb it's safe. You know, you don't pay attention to it. But um, if it's something like bending your finger back where you're going to start bending it back too far and it starts hurting, then of course you want to pay attention to that. I mean, your brain is telling you accurately there's danger. Stop doing that. Right. And and I'd like to say that um, there it's also with autoimmune symptoms. I mean, I, 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 I stretch it a bit. It's not just about chronic pain because people will have numbing and tingling or different sensations um, in their belly or tinnitus. As far as I'm concerned and from my studies and working with Dr. Hanscom and studying from these doctors, you know, understanding the brain and inflammation that 
these symptoms are coming from a psychological, it's a psychological, in other words, I just lost my train of thought. In other words, the brain is protecting. And if the body's attacking itself for no reason, there's no tumor, God forbid, there's no structural. And these, and the body heals from these things. So even just anything chronic, I believe, can be helped by this work. So if the brain's protecting you, but there are people who are having excruciating a lot of like number 10. And then Gordon talks about the dial turned up. And that's what you're saying. The dial is a 10. You will get symptoms. You will get pains in your stomach. You will get tinnitus. You will get ringing. You will get, you know, diarrhea. I mean, yeah. this is, go ahead. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're making a list of the ways that the brain can tell you that there's a problem. And it's very small, you know, I mean, you, you know, you imply there's a lot, but right, it's 10 or 20 different ways that the brain can tell you that it's distressed. There's 10 million signals coming into the brain, right? I mean, and there's, and there's 20 or so outputs that the brain can say, wait a minute, something's wrong, something's wrong. And, and, you know, so the brain can let you know that something's wrong in many ways. <laughs> And, uh, and sometimes it makes mistakes. And we can change that. I like to call it a communication, a language that we have with the brain. Like, did you actually talk to your brain and did you talk to your shoulder? And you, you know, you say safe, sorry, but safe. Did you actually have this? Cause I have people like have a dialogue, especially as they're responding and not reacting. It's, it's like, they're pausing. Oh, there's my pain. Well, I want to just be angry and get rid of it. But they're, I ask them to have a communication. So do you talk more about that? Because that's the, that's the unconscious mind and the conscious mind trying to be connected. Yeah, well, sorry, but say, is, you know, in my experience and the experience of the people I've worked with, you know, probably one of the most useful phrases in the English language, you know, for getting over chronic pain, sorbet safe, sorbet safe, acknowledging that there is an inappropriate response of the brain. Um, and even there, you know, just because you're in pain doesn't mean you're in danger. Uh, take the example of an athlete who's had a hard workout, right? And their, their muscles are sore. Um, you know, they would be disappointed if they weren't sore. I mean, they would feel like I haven't worked out hard enough. I mean, they're happy that they're sore. This is the appropriate thing that they're sore because they had a hard workout. Now, just imagine you woke up in the morning and you had exactly the same sensation as that athlete does, but you know, you hadn't worked out right. I mean, you'd freak out, right? I mean, if you had exactly Absolutely. that same sore sensation, you would just, you know, go crazy. And so, the idea is Absolutely. it's possible to be sore but safe. It's possible to be sore but safe. And it and if you have credible evidence that you're safe, like you know, wake up in the morning and get out of bed, as I mentioned, and your back hurts, well, that's the way it is, right? That always happens for a few minutes until I get moving and all that kind of stuff. I am safe. And so if it's necessary, stay sore but safe instead of letting something more destructive run through your brain. Instead of what you really don't want to do is tap into fear. And especially you don't want to tap into catastrophization. You don't want to tap into the fear oh my pain God, cycle. Is it never going to get worse. Is this is this the rest of my life? Is my back going to hurt every morning when I wake up? Is this my life? You know, is this is this what I'm doomed to? You know, all oh my is there nothing can I do? I mean, that kind of fear and catastrophization has been clinically demonstrated to amplify pain really, really, really wow. well. Very wow. effective. so true. There were studies done at Stanford, you know, borderline unethical in my mind, because they they took people with sensation and they took one group and they they coached them in in catastrophization. Basically, they said, ask them questions like, "Well, how would you feel if this pain never went away? What if this was the rest of your life?" They coached them in that. The other group, not. So the group they coached in catastrophization. I mean, their pain got horrible bad. And, they, they insist that they were able to reverse this and tell people, oh, yeah, we were just, you know, doing an experiment. But the point is, if you catch yourself, if I catch myself going into catastrophization, if I catch myself 
generating experiences of fear, I mean, if if it's if it's a justifiable fear, okay, then I'm going to go to a physician, then I'm going to go to someone, I'm going to go to a physical therapist, I'm going to find out if I'm actually in danger. But if I if I'm not actually in danger, I want to be really careful not to generate the experience of pain, of fear. And so saying something like sorbet safe, sorbet safe, like a mantra, just keeps my brain out of mischief. It's excellent. Did you make that up? No, I I think that I got that from Lorimer Mosley. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Or the, the other one is motion is lotion. Right. Like and, um, you know, or get better at feeling not rather than feel better, because it is true that, you know, I, I imagine, I mean, Gordon didn't go into this in the movie so much, but it does come out in every angle of it that, I mean, this Sarno, like people say Sarno versus Gordon. I say there's the best of both of them. I mean, we, there's a feeling being repressed. I mean, you're angry. It's five years. You have a shoulder. You're like not, you're like, just like, it was like this, there's yeah. feelings, there, there's emotions. There's. Yeah. I have these two books, right. That, you know, right. that I give people, which one I mean, pretty much everyone can benefit from the way out. It's, uh, it's, it's excellent really book. easy to read. It's very entertaining. It's cheap. It's, 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 it's entertaining, easy to read. It's cheap. also an audio book and um, it's, it's, and then it's really, it's, it's written very well. It's written now very well. Now this one, you know, the Unlearn Your Pain by Howard Schubiner. This is the other one that, you know, I found to be really useful. Um, and this is for people who do recognize that there are stressors in their life that are contributing to their pain, either from their present life or from their past, from childhood abuse, from things like that. Um, this is kind of a do-it-yourself, resolve your own stressors. And it's a, it's a workbook, you know, a lot of pages where you put your, what are your feelings about this and affirmation. No, it's very important. There's a lot of research about writing your feelings and, and writing, writing out your... All this kind of stuff. And so this book is really useful for someone who recognizes that they do have stressors in their life that they want to address in a kind of a systematic way. And and of course, it can also bring you to the point where you realize you need professional counseling to, to help deal with the stressors. Uh, you know, the third book that I find most useful, well, I mean, I mean, Sarno's books are very useful for a lot of people. Um, you know, I certainly benefited from reading Sarno's books. Um, and then the other one is uh, Laura Mermosley and David Butler about about uh, explain pain explain pain this is another yeah. you know real classic very very useful book for people yeah. and so you know my suggestion for someone who was in chronic pain and wanted to begin the healing process would be you know watch videos like on the chronic pain science channel read books go to websites you know if you look up these people's names the names of the people who are there or, or on the tms website there's there's resources you know, start just spending an hour a day looking into this kind of stuff. Just and then, you know, maybe you can join a program if there's one available for you. But there's enormous amount of resources out there. And I always tell people you can heal without a therapist. You can heal, but if you're not implementing the research, if you're not implementing the education, if you're not applying it, not on the yoga mat, <laughs> in the office. When you're in most stressed, in traffic, when you're triggered, this is the opportunity. And in the movie, the woman says, uh, uh, you know, he, Gordon says, are you in pain? She says, yeah, but it's an opportunity. So it's changing, it's shifting pers pers your perspective. I'm not a victim. I have an opportunity. Now, Doc, like, it's BS. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm struggling. How can I... So it is, it's, I'm not, I'm not underestimating anybody's pain. I'm simply saying it, it, it's possible to shift perspective and observe your pain and witness your situation and not be attached to it. And that immediately triggers the brain to calm. I mean, people can have an immediate shift, you know? Um, yes. So I had this client who, who had pain and he was dealing with it. He was doing the Sarno work, but he always had increased, increased pain when he was at the playground with his daughter. She was three years old. So he wasn't climbing 
you know, sliding boards. What happened was he was feeling responsible. He was feeling worried. He even shared that he, um, he was uh, thinking about when she got older. And sometimes he even felt a little bored, like not interested. And maybe he was judging himself. So it was fascinating. And we had to figure out like what was really going on deep inside of the playground. And why did his back pain increase? So it's, it could be, it can, it can, you, you can unfold it like that. You know, you can really unfold it. And it's, you know, as, as Michael Galinsky will say, it's almost like it's this pathway to know yourself. He was supposed to call the movie. I mentioned it on every show. Instead of all the rage, he was going to call it all the acceptance. But it was not going to sell in the box office if he called it all the acceptance. And that's yeah. really what it's about. We're, we're, we're unpeeling layers of ourself. The pain is a message coming from some deep place. And it can, it can serve you. It can help you, not hurt you. Absolutely. I mean, it's really important to understand the distinction between sensation, pain, and suffering. Right? There's sensation, which can be plus or negative. Then there's pain. Pain is unpleasant. Wait, wait, I want to write this down. Sensation. Sensation, pain, suffering. So if sensation can be positive, negative, whatever. When it's when when you feel the sensation is unpleasant, then that's what we call pain. Unpleasant sensation we call pain. Now, if you want to move into suffering, then it's not enough for it to just be unpleasant. It has to be, you have the feeling it should not be this way. This is not right. Suffering you know? is your reaction. Suffering is your thoughts, your reaction that this is not the way it should be. This is not right. You know, this is unfair. This is, this is ridiculous. This is so, so you can watch in your own brain, you know, for some that transition between sensation which could doesn't you know maybe you're sore from running and you can have intense sensation without having it be pain uh pain is when you excellent, start excellent. it's unpleasant suffering is when you decide it shouldn't be the way it is well, gordon says that you have that sensations plus fear equal pain yes that's right and that's the whole purpose of, that's why we do this thing because basically we're trying to help people learn to reduce their fear right? by reducing that. And because it, there's that pain fear loop and that's the heart of the, of the teaching that I do in, in our own chronic pain recovery program, that pain fear loop. And you can't attack the pain directly, but you can work on the fear. Right. You can decrease the fear. I had a question for you about, um, so, I love this about decreasing people's sensitization. And somebody was talking, I mean, you're, you're decreasing your heightened, you're de you, you have a, you have a you dial at number 10 and you want to get into a habit of waking up in the morning and having a dial at number five. Oh, I have a little, so it's almost, so we want to decrease the sens sensitization. We want to, keep the dial down or have the ability to dial down from 10 to 9 to 8 to 7 to 6 uh, easily without suffering or struggling or we want to be in a habit of just recognizing oh the dial's up i forgot to turn it down because i had some discomfort last night or i had an accident some and, and it, because i had a trigger so part of it is is it's like a taking care of yourself it's understanding yourself it's you know, it's a lot of these things that get into the psychological and all these are addressed in, in, you know, Schrubiner. I mean, Schrubiner has his book, Unlearn Your Pain, Unlearn Your Anxiety. So he's connecting the two. And I mean, the help is out there. And I don't want people, I want people to feel that sometimes they have to hit rock bottom before they improve. Sometimes they just have to get better at feeling rather than feeling better. They have to lower the stakes. They have to bring down the expectations. They have to have enormous compassion. And and what would you say? How would you want to end our show? And what I kind would of say the bottom line is that that chronic pain is a very 
serious, very real problem that involves neural pathways in the brain that have become established over a period of time, and that uh, this is a very significant problem, and it's and it's not going to go away with a few platitudes or you know watching one video or something like that. I mean, basically, you need to work at it. Is my experience, and it, you know, I'm talking about like an hour a day for a month. It's, and, you know, whether you do it by yourself, whether you've involved a professional, but, you know, if you really want to um, to recover from chronic pain, I recommend, you know, start reading a book, you know, buy one of these books, you know, start reading it. John Sarno's advice um, for how to recover from chronic pain after his three hour lecture was read my books and keep reading my books until your pain goes away read them over and over again until your pain goes away i, was you know, I want to add in honor of dr sarno 96 and he got to see the movie before he passed he would be on the show saying and also read the book and implement what i say implement because reading is up in here you have to apply it and this is my big thing you have to get into the game and you're not going to implement it on the yoga mat. It's not going to work there. It's going to have to be implemented when you're in. Now you took, you put your hand in the sling, you calm, you calm the pain, but you you still had the pain, but you you were in a position. It was like somebody smoking a joint or a cigarette. They calm themselves, and then they're able to read the book. I'm okay with that. Whatever it takes to bring calm, but get to the cause of the problem which is the brain and your relationship with your and your language and so look i want to bring you back on the show and talk about your work with the aging because how many people i'm working with are getting triggered because they're dealing with the mortality and they can't deal with their aging and it just becomes a bigger trigger and maybe we can have some um shed some light for some of my senior clients I think me and you were seniors also. I think so. Anyway, let's not talk about that. But anyway, I'm 77. I, and how do you feel about your mortality? I'm, I'm, um, well, this is a this is a complicated subject involving Ram Dass and other leaders, but uh, it's a whole separate topic. But I'm fine. I'm fine uh, with my mortality. Well, so listen, we had we had uh, we had Ram Dass's. Uh, it was his secretary. He was uh, Ramdas went to Doctor Sarno. He called him because Michael. We we had this conversation with this guy who wrote um, a, a book, the latest book about Ramdas, and it is fascinating. And you know what, what was his first book? Be here now. Right. So wow, you really are very right brain. You really have that artistic side to you. <laughs> Will you come back in a few weeks and we can talk about? chronic pain and mortality. That would be a wonderful, wonderful show. And I think we would, um, we'd fill the studio. Would you, would you join us in a few weeks and have that topic again? Sure. Sir, it's a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate I, it. I mean, I, you're not retiring with me around. I'm busy with you. I'm emailing you. I'm asking you to send me this and send me that. So I'm sorry that I demanded all that from you this week. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm happy. Um, I'm happy. I'm enjoying this kind of work. I really, you know, enjoy the opportunity to um, pass on Great. some of the things that that people have taught me. Wow, you're making a big difference, and I'm excited to share uh, your YouTube's again. That study. If anyone's in California, I'll share the study. If you need people still, I mean, it sounds like an amazing opportunity for people. But you can do it on Zoom also. Yeah. So maybe you'll send me that and I'll advertise and you'll get some phone calls. And if okay. you ever want to like open up a Facebook page, I'll help you with that. Yeah. Or if anyone wants to find it, you can go to just, if you're in your handsome lab in a, in a search, you'll get to my web page, which I'm going to send it up. It was very interesting. I, I read it today, but I want to just thank you personally from the bottom of my heart. And I'm just very excited that you're not only involved in the Pain Brain movie and you've made this great machine and you're also going to give one to Dr. Schubiner to use. You know, um, <laughs> he, he likes he likes the machine. He just wrote me back yesterday um, or day before that uh, that he really likes it, but he's not seeing individual patients anymore. Right. So he so doesn't really have it. a use for it because it's kind of designed what it's really my hope is to make more of these. I've, I've got a physiotherapist who really wants one down at Cottage Hospital Rehab. We're making one for her and 
making one for some other people because my 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 dream is that people could have this and and if you interact with it I and mean, it's one thing to have me do it but if you do it yourself you raise the finger and you press the yeah. button and yeah. you have that kind of physical kind of relationship to it i think it it helps in the learning and so i'd love to have some of these around for people well i'm going to um promote the youtube and here in israel there's lots of doctors and scientists who might love it i'm going to send them um either this or you have something specific about the machine i'm happy to promote it for you this is this is actually the first presentation anywhere ever of this new machine this is the first time that's ever been seen by anyone outside of my lab and great if you want to do a special little promo i'll share it all over i i you know i i don't know that i do i i, I what i want to do for now is building some i'm i'm building one that i want to show to alan gordon um and I, I'm, I'm starting out just to build one for some specialists and see how well it works for them and great it took five years of iterations and hundreds of different biofeedback devices and we had we had biofeedback devices had 20 different sensors on the body at once wow. totally monitored it took a long time to get to something you know yeah. it's simple and i think it's the same way with the demo i want to evolve it you know in, in interaction with with practitioners and with patients for quite a long time before Amazing. before it gets you know down to where it's Worth well, yeah. Well, worth you're it. launching your second career with this, so let your wife know that you're not retired. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if I can help in any way, I would be I happy to be a messenger for you, and I'll I'll uh, I'll Thanks. send you the copy of this YouTube. It'll be on our channel tomorrow. And if I can help anyone out there with this work on PRT certified from Alan Gordon, it's been amazing opportunity to help people to have a healthy relationship with their brain which means themselves, which means their heart, which means their body and spirit, because it's pretty much everything. And it is energy, which is another topic. Anyway, until we get to the next topic, I thank you so much again. Have a oh. wonderful rest of the day. And thank you again for your time. God bless. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay, so we're off the air.